Google. I'm art, artist and author Mark Heine from Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, this is video number nine in my Elements of Painting series. Um, let's get straight to uh, the slideshow I put together to uh, uh, start where we left off from the last video. So screen share. There we go. And our first element of uh, painting uh, in this video is reflected color. And uh, I believe I've, I've made note of that in several other uh, points along the way in this video series. Reflected color is something that I, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about and I really tend to uh, pay a lot of attention to it and exaggerate it quite a bit because I find that <clears throat> reflected color, uh, exaggerated reflected color adds a lot of richness uh, to a painting. <clears throat> um, the um, uh, You can see in this particular piece, this is part of a demo that's been consistent through the series. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the, the, the more shiny or reflected the surface, uh, the stronger the reflected light is going to be. So this is my daughter, Sarah, playing in the pool in the backyard. And uh, her hair is wet here. So I've got some of this aqua bluish color, even a little bit hotter than the, than the original color, reflecting into the back of the hair here, a little bit touches of it here and here, a little bit less intense up here and back here, a little bit less intense. Uh, and uh, and up through the, the hair here. So that amount of reflected color uh, is not in the material that I'm working with, but I'm, I want to exaggerate it and by, uh, and so in order to exaggerate it, I have to know where it would occur and why it would occur and what color it's going to be. And, uh, and uh, that's all part of learning these, um, these elements to be able to control them. Uh, there's reflected color coming into the back edge of the floaty device, a little bit of reflected color, you know, just suggestions here and there, uh, little glimpses of it here and there, um, just tends to, 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 um, intensify the work. There's some fun things happening back here in terms of focus where we've got whatever's underwater here in the background distorted and kind of soft edge, which makes the the hair a little bit sharper focus because it's set against a soft uh, distorted background shape uh, there's a lot of reflected light from this magenta uh, it's clear plastic on the top and kind of a pinky magenta color on the bottom and that magenta color is reflecting into the back of the of the uh, flesh tone here and you can see in the shadow colors here, it's uh, it's a lot of that reflected magenta. And then, of course, up through all through the hair here, is uh, is reflected magenta from uh, the light bouncing off of various objects. So, reflected color is something like I said I play with a lot, and uh, and you can exaggerate it, you can distort it, you can change the color a little bit to create kind of an interesting effect. Uh, so that's definitely something to play with a little bit. Um, uh, like I said, this this highlight, for instance, here on the back edge of this hair, it's actually brighter than the original color uh, of the pool bottom that you're seeing through the distortion of the water. So you know, it's stuff like that. You can you can just just heat it up a little bit more than than natural, and uh, and and it creates an effect that 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 you can play with so um reflected color i think is is quite an important well you got audio there we go quite an important part this is not a particularly good um <clears throat> uh, example of it but this is a little painting i did a long time ago and and uh and you can see it's twilight because the the, the street lights are on this is trounce alley in victoria and we're looking here we can see some light reflecting in the window over here and maybe some some lights that are on uh, uh, because it's it, the sun's coming going down, and then we've got sunset and the sun is reflecting in this window. And then I've distorted the color of this this building to pick up some of the pink of the of the uh, 
sunset that's behind us and uh, and it works as kind of a a nice uh offset of color to the uh tealish bluish uh uh sky color uh so uh, a friend of mine uh old friend of mine who's passed away a few years ago uh bob gen uh he and i used to be uh resident artists at the painters and painters event uh, held up in Campbell River each year, where it was about 30 or so artists that would get together. And we'd spend a weekend uh, set up around this resort, and we'd be painting things, painting scenery, and people would come and we could talk with them and 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 share kind of what we're doing. And it was a very fun event. And I remember one time spending some time sitting with Bob Gann, who always sat down on the dock, this little dock, a fishing dock, uh, in front of the... the uh, Painter's Lodge, which is famous for salmon fishing. So it had all these little boats and a little dock there. And um, and there was a picnic table that he could work on. And Bob would be sitting there and he'd be painting a little piece of masonite with acrylic. Uh, and um, uh, it would ha the subject that he's painting has nothing to do with what's in front of him. He's just making it up uh, from his imagination. So he's he's doing a landscape and he had quite abstract sort of tree forms and maybe some mountain. And because he did so much teaching, he'd be doing this kind of mumbling monologue, um, mumble, 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 mumble about, uh, you know, this is too dark. I need to light not up. So he'd he'd mix up another color and paint it over. And so he he developed this this uh, scene, quite abstract, uh, very kind of Tom Thompson ish type of feel, and uh, group of seven kind of feel. And and then. Um, once he got the the composition balanced the way he wanted and uh, whatever, then the last thing he'd do is he'd put in the color surprise. And it would usually be a little bit of you know, green, bright green, maybe like a chartreuse type green or a or an intense red, like a cad red or something. And he'd put a few dots in the foreground that would supposedly signify maybe little blossoms that are happening from rocks that are growing up or flowers that grow up from the rocks or something like that little un, unspecified spots of color and he used to always call them color surprises and uh, and the intensity of those colors would set off the colors uh, complementary colors in the painting and so the little drops of green would make the the green or little drops of red in the painting would make the greens more intense and 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 stuff so he was always a big thing for adding a little bit of a color surprise to his work so something kind of fun to consider um another element to to play with uh abstracted color so this is a, a diptych that i did uh years ago and uh uh it's uh my daughter sarah and her friends in ballet class uh <clears throat> and uh and so the color on this one is quite distorted uh playing around with uh distorted color a lot of light coming in through the background so we've got this bluish color reflected in in some of the back edges of of the forms uh so abstracting color um there's an artist uh uh over in white rock uh that i can't remember his name right now it's crazy um <clears throat> it'll come to me in a sec uh who always said that that you don't necessarily have to worry about local color and when we're talking about local color, we're talking about a, a bush being green. It doesn't have to be green. Uh, it can be blue. Uh, uh, the the water doesn't have to be blue. It can be purple. Uh, you can play with the uh, local color, it's called, the actual color of the object. You can play with that. And, and it, it, as long as the values are right, as long as... The darks in the painting are dark and the lights in the painting are light. So the things in the foreground have more contrast than the things in the distance. As long as the values are correct, uh, the black and white values, the 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 things that are dark are, are dark. Things are light are light. And uh, as long as those values are right, it will look right, even if the colors are different. Mike Swab is his name. And uh, and Mike does this all the time. He he distorts the local color of the object and makes it something totally different. And, and the, the, the end product can 
be realistic, but it's it's because the objects are not what we typically would expect. Uh, it adds a real interest and intensity of color, uh, but it looks right because the the blue tree is the right value. It's a dark enough blue to create depth of field and stuff like that. So you can play with those those colors. Uh, as long as the values are correct, the painting will, will work. And it's it's kind of a fun thing to play with. So Mike is an expert in that. And uh, and here, of course, is uh, obviously abstracted color. This is Maxfield Parrish, another uh, influence of mine. Uh, in this piece, I find uh, I, that it's a little overboard, uh, <laughs> the abstract color and and the crispness of the, the imagery in the distance. There is certainly aerial perspective and a lot of saturation in the shadows, but I lose the focal point. I mean, we've got a little bit of a secondary focal point here, secondary focal point here, secondary focal point here, another secondary here, a secondary here. And really not a lot of primary focal point, in my opinion. Uh, but uh, I wanted to put this one in because it is an example of, of uh, exaggerated or abstracted color. Um, yeah, he used to do that a lot, Maxfield Parrish. And uh, and then this is one of mine. Uh, it, I wanted to show this one because it, the color is abstracted from reality. Uh, I did that intentionally, but then there's also uh, some color in it that is uh, closer to reality. This this little touch of of greeny yellow, whatever it is, moss foliage uh, clinging to the top of this this uh, beach rock. Uh, so it creates an effect where it's partially abstracted color the the background of the uh painting and the overall color scheme of the painting this is sand and it's blue right uh and the rock has a little bit of color on it but it's not typically what you see from beach rock uh so played around with a bit of a color to create a an abstracted color scheme that has some elements of reality so it makes i think an interesting effect there's a nice uh, you know, reflected uh, 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 image here from from the mountain that's distorted in the in the shape of the sand and and stuff like that. So another example of, of abstracted color, but not quite as abstracted, just enough to to make it unusual. You can see there's a, a fair amount of blue here in the background hill so that we're getting some aerial perspective effects, a little bit of magenta too, so it pushes that hill back. And then of course I played with the the softness of any kind of detail in that background uh, form so that it doesn't uh, distract uh, and, and pull that background too far forward. And and so we maintain that depth of field. So an example of, of abstracting color a little. Uh, this one here, uh, this painting is called Photosynthesis, and and the back label about this was about about plants and and color, and so um, so I abstracted the color in this painting intentionally to uh, talk about uh, what was happening in the back label uh, and the story of the painting, which is about photosynthesis. So complementary colors are. Um, <clears throat> something to work with uh they're a little dangerous uh because you put orange against blue or purple against yellow or green against red and you're going to create what's called a discord where there's a vibration that happens between two colors put side by side that that happens in the mind and uh and so you can uh and when you do put complementary colors side by side, you create that energy, that discord, and it makes either one of the colors more intense. So here there's an example of this. Where we've got quite a bit of blue, and then next to it is the, the intensity of the orange in the costume, and uh, and it creates a, a, a intensity of color that that, when put in the focal point, can draw attention to the focal point. So something to consider, something to be wary of. You can use it. Uh, 
you also have to be careful it doesn't occur naturally uh and that's why you should pre-plan uh things uh, and look at things in your material before you start so that you don't accidentally set up a discord that um that is going to create a lot of uh energy and uh if you do that say in the background the background if you've got complimentary color in the background if it's red and green or whatever in a sunset that will pull that forward because of the energy of the discord and and whatever you got in the foreground won't uh won't be the foreground anymore so it won't be the focal point if that's what you want the focal point to be so you can you can manipulate this so this is again one of those tools that you can work with to to create um what you're what it is you're looking for the effect you're looking for uh color harmony that's this is more of a uh, a, a sense of taste uh, and choice, uh, but um, you know, think about uh, what colors work nicely together. I have a book here somewhere. There it is. Let me just grab that. This book I got years and years ago called the Designer's Guide to Color, and uh, what it does is on this page. Hang on, let me get there. On this page, you got a whole bunch of different colors. And in the center of each color, there's a number. And so you go to, on this instance, page number 30. And it takes that color and it compares it to a bunch. Let me get it in front of here. A bunch of different colors. So you can get a sense of how the colors work together. Uh, so... You know, it's quite a quite a handy book. When I was doing commercial work, I used to use this a lot, and I used to put little bits of of uh, post-it note as as um, as bookmarks for it. So this uh, came out, and then it followed with a, a few more. So this is Designer's Guide to Color Two. What a uh, an original name. Uh, so this book is a little bit different. You can actually, uh, has, comes a thing in the front where you can cut out a little square and use it as a mask to block out other colors. But this one here, it compares groups of colors or triads, three, three uh, uh, colors together and how those colors, it shows you how those colors work together. And then we have tints. It's a very high key, tints of certain colors see that's a nice combination there so and it, and of course that's a, a personal choice a little bit of gray and yellow so gives you an idea of what certain colors work together like and 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 if you find them pleasing that works for your taste then then you can employ them and then it goes through tints it matches things to grays and then it gets darker and more saturated colors and and some polka dots and and there, some of these darker values, quite nice colors. So that's a handy book to have. And then there's Designer's Guide to Color 3, which is somewhere in the studio. And then we have Designer's Guide to Color 4, which is um, looking at different types of patterns and colors and how they work together. So um, you can get a sense. Look at some of these really, really muted uh subtle tones and how they work together and and they all create a feel um that uh that you can that you can utilize uh and so it just it just gives you a, a good starting point to um uh to think about when you when you can choose what the the colors are so say for instance in this painting i in my material i've got uh this this strong uh sapphire bluish kind of color um i can i can just look that up and designers got to color one there we go it's kind of dark in here but um here it is kind of kind of that color pretty close so that's page number 24 so we can look at page number 24 and we get that color compared to a, a bunch of other kind of random colors and we can see if there's anything in there that we kind of like the interaction between the colors you can see there's quite a discord there between the red and the blue even though they're not complementary that's more of a complementary uh, uh comparison 
but uh, anyway, uh, so those are those are handy books to have. Uh, but in terms of an overall color harmony, it's it's a good thing to pre-plan and and work towards, uh, and and have an idea of of what you want to work towards before you start. So that's uh, a good element. And I think we're almost out of time here. All right, we'll do trend. Oops, hang on. Uh, maybe we won't do transitional areas. Let me back that up a bit. Where are we? There we go. Let's do transitional areas. It's one of the last ones here, uh, or, or um, the last one for this video. Transitional areas are huge for me. I just love transitional areas. And uh, I don't know if there's another term for it. I've always called them transitional areas. Other people that I talked to, Brian Johnson, uh, loves to work with transitional areas and, and actually creates them when they're not there. And what a transitional area is, is uh, the, the boundary between one object and the next. So right here we have this area of shadow, and then we've got this color in the background, and this color is reflecting into this this fabric and the 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 line between the the background and the foreground gets blurred and uh, uh the human mind wants that to be defined wants to wants to to put a line there so it it works towards filling that or defining that space and it creates a really interesting um a challenge for the brain and and when you can challenge the viewer and get them interested and get them excited and get their mind going why isn't there a line there there should be a line there oh my god i gotta figure out why there isn't a line there and so it, it really engages the uh the viewer uh to uh to to look at the painting and resolve those mysteries and so here we have a little bit of a a uh, little bit of a, a transitional area there. We got a big transitional area here where the background kind of blends in with the foreground. Some some really lost edges. It's really lost edges that that uh, uh, create transitional areas. We've lost the edges here. We lost the edges here, and we go right from a really dark color here to a, to a fairly light color here. And there's no defining edge that shows where the hair ends and the the neck and the skin begins, and all those different transitional areas really uh, create a lot of interest. And then again, like in the previous video, in terms of light positive, positive and dark positive, this this object, this this figure in this space, has uh, areas that are light against a darker background and dark against a lighter background. Uh, and it happens over and over, uh, light against dark, dark against light. Uh, and what that does is it puts the subject into the surface, not on. So it's into the surface and it creates uh, a real uh, depth of field. Um, and then, of course, in this painting, there's there's lots of uh, uh, suspension of gravity effects. And then there's there's some light effects and broken light. There's a lot of motion. We've got the motion of this. If this were a video, this piece of fabric would be moving in a certain feel very slowly. The character itself is in motion. Uh, and um, and then we've got some water. We've certainly got action happening in the, the reflection. And then we've got uh, you know some water being pulled down by the movement of the arm. Uh, so there's there's all kinds of action implied in uh, this one without having any kind of blurred motion effects. It's implied movement. So, and and in this particular painting, uh, we can see quite clearly uh, this uh, amulet uh, thing, which uh, I have in my studio. Oops, it's in the other room. It's, a, it's a, an object that uh, I designed uh, and um, cast out of uh, silver uh, solder. Uh, and it has a pearl in the center of it. And the pattern shape, the swirl pattern, is something that we picked up, or I picked up off the fabric 
that we chose for the costume design that became an integral part of the storyline of of the sirens book uh so this this pattern which is called the the tear of serenia uh in the storyline uh is a huge part of the story and that came from just the fact that this fabric we found had swirls on it and uh and that became a, a, a big part of the story a big part of the costume so it's funny how they, th these things happen so anyway let's get out of this uh this sharing mode and uh so that's the end of uh i think it's nine video nine uh of uh, uh elements of painting and uh we're getting close to the end i think uh so um i uh, hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it and uh uh hope that you'll come back and and uh pick up where we left off with uh, the uh next series of elements of painting in the series thanks for joining me and uh, take care